So they're just not out there uh, to scare people. They actually do have a function in the ecosystem. So that's what I'm going to sort of talk about. I'm going to talk about some general info. I'm going to talk about uh, the genera and the species that we have out there in the Waitaki Ranges. And I'm also going to talk about some of their superpowers and why uh, we should actually look after them and uh, treat them with a bit more, with a bit of respect, I suppose. And, uh, uh, and entomologists, that's what I like to do. So, first of all, I'm just going to give you a bit of a general rundown so they're nocturnal, although I've seen them outside during daylight and storm, so when those low pressure systems come over and the sky darkens, sometimes they come out. Um, mainly herbivorous, but they do eat other things as well. Uh, and we'll scavenge on uh, deep invertebrates as well. So they can be diverse and bundle in some areas. Yeah, they're just, uh, especially when there's pest management being done. So in those areas where uh, those vertebrate pests are taken out, then they can be quite abundant. Some produce corns, some have ears. And so they can, you know, you often, well, there was some information that they were too low to hear, but you can hear the scratchings of some of them, the stridulation as well, uh, out there sometimes. Uh, those hind legs, those large hind legs that you see on them, are mainly for escape or defense. And peanut butter, uh, they're pretty easy to catch if you have peanut butter, and often uh, we are the first to visit tracking tunnels where you have a bait of peanut butter in the middle there. Uh, and they'll come in, walk along those thin tracks and then leave their uh, lovely tracks out the other way. So uh, I, um, I've collected them uh, quite readily by using peanut butter. Uh, they'll, they just stop still and uh, you can walk up and grab them quite easily at night. So yeah, don't to leave. I don't know why uh, that's the case, but it is. Maybe that's why they come into people's houses looking for peanut butter. Okay, just a little bit of a general thing about Orthoptera, so uh, which we are a part of. So this insect group is distinguished from every other insect by those large jumping legs, hind legs, and chewing mouth parts. So they're easily adaptable to feed on a wide range of different uh, sources. So vegetation right through to animal matter as well, and fungi. Now the life cycle, it goes through incomplete metamorphosis. So it starts with the adult, they lay an egg, and then the egg hatches and it goes through a number of instars or nymphs. Okay? In the case of uh, the cave weather, forest weather, tree and ground weather, it has 10 instars. Whereas the giant weathers, they go, they go for an extra instar of 11. So 11 instars to reach adulthood. Now, uh, so those instars, they're like uh, mini adults, so they look like little um, adults, they feed on the same resources as those adults, but they don't have the reproductive parts until the last, um, when they move into being an adult. Um, but of course, during that stage from egg through to adult, they're a lot more vulnerable and easily fed on by a wide range of different uh, animals, native as well as introduced. And of course, they're more likely to jump around uh, the, the adults as well. Okay, so now I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, the genera that are uh, found in the Waitaku Ranges. So there's the ground weather, 
uh, genus Hemiandrus. Um, it lives in burrows on the forest floor. And as you can see up here, I'm pointing my mic, mouse arrow, so the top uh, right hand of my screen. So that's a picture of the ground rooter. There's seven to 30 mil long, so it's the, the, um, the smallest uh, rooter species is a ground rooter of seven mil. But I'm not sure if they have, they have ears or calls. I have, couldn't find any uh, information on that, so that we good thing to look into if you want to ground it. Oh, okay. oh, that's right. I forgot to uh, uh, through this one. So, yeah, the New Zealand families that we have um, are at the, at the, well, Florida, the cave or the forest weather. So, I've put the, I've called the forest weather those small little uh, weather that uh, you see on the forest floor. I'm not so, they're often called cave weathers, but I think that's a little bit, um, they're not always found in caves, they're most likely found on the forest floor. That's where I've seen them mostly. That's where I picked them up, I picked them up as well. So, and then there's the tree, ground, and giant weathers that are going to, and it's through Stomatidae. Okay, so those ground weather down on the forest floor, Living burrows. Uh, I'm not sure if they have ears or claws. I've never encountered uh, either of those things on them. And then the forest, and I've got them with seeds cave weather. And the genera that um, is on my naturalist is Neonicus and Calotropus. So those uh, two, um, plus there's a wide range of different species in, there, in those two genera. Again, found on the forest floor uh, in another story as well. And that's tumbling. Uh, they're around 10 to 20 mil long, so not that uh, big. No ears and also uh, long antennae. Um, so those antennae, they use that to pick up vibrations and warn them of predators, approaching predators, and so forth. And of course they can use them to feel out the environment as well, and touch anything that might be coming towards them, and it's dangerous. Okay, the other uh, genera that we have is Happy Rama, uh, which is a the cave wheels that you see in caves, <laughs> and in the forest as well. We're out there in the forest as well, so I've seen them there. So they have a body length of about 25 to 45 mil long. Of course, their legs and antennae are much, much longer than that. Uh, and you can often see them, as in the photo above uh, in the right hand corner there, you can see they're packed in in a densely arranged on the ceiling and walls of our uh, cave. And not many people like that experience. And they look up and see a sea of uh, cave weavers looking down at them, or not even looking at them at all, just minding their own business. Again, they have no ears and they have no claws. Um, of course, that's an adaptation. Imagine uh, in a cave making a whole bunch of stridulation, uh, you wouldn't be able to pick out which one is which. So there'd be too many echoes and so forth. Imagine clacking uh, cages in a cave, trying to everyone into. So that's why an adaptation to that sort of uh, the habitat they live in. So, uh, so that's it. Then the tree uh, weather is the next weather that's found in the Waitaki Ranges. So, Hemidina uh, is the genus, and there's um, if you spread around uh, New Zealand. Again, this is an arboreal, well this is an arboreal species, so you find this from the shrub layer right up through to the canopy. It has ears, and it also uh, makes calls. So that's, this is a weather that uh, mostly uh, in the making 
forests in the forest. The birds have a, a longer and broader body as well. So that's a very different shape from, uh, from the others as well. And of course, I like the chords. Keep it to the speed up. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the species within the, um, those genera that I've just introduced, except um, I'm just going to concentrate on the cave weathers and the tree weather as well. So these, uh, there's two species of Carolina in uh, the Waitakere Ranges. Um, this one here at the top is one that you usually encounter quite regularly. It's got a darker body and it's got pale uh, segments, um, pale stripes at each of the uh, segment joints. So you can tell apart from most other uh, weather that will be in those uh, cave systems. It's not actually the Auckland uh, cave weather. Uh, Pacarama Anthocera. Uh, it's that one. Um, so the range is from sort of midway through the North Island and the north to Cape Breen. It has a larger, quite a large body, 35 to 45 mil. And as I said, uh, there's that uh, easily distinguishable from other, uh, other winter in the cave. Then the next species, the one further down, is Papyrama, I hope I'm saying that uh, correctly, Cabernet. I've, um, I've coined this as the Cavern uh, Cave Weather uh, to differentiate from the Auckland uh, Cave Weather. So Auckland Cave Weather is solely not in Auckland, as I've said, and the uh, same with the Cavern um, Cave Weather as well. It's found in uh, ranges from that same sort of midway in the North Island, Taranaki across the Napier and then up to uh, Whangarei, possibly further as well, but by natural so only headed uh, to uh, Whangarei, so the, the range would be longer as well. The body is a lot smaller, the body is brown and it has this reddish or yellowish um, marbling across it as well, so a uh, lot, uh, quite easy to distinguish from uh, the Auckland Cave weather. Now, why do they have these big, huge, long legs? Um, obviously, they can leap uh, if disturbed. Some of those uh, things can leap you know, two plus metres, and so they uh, can escape any sort of predator relatively quickly and effectively, but uh, research has shown here at Auckland University that the males have uh, exaggerated long legs and the reason for that is that they uh, protect the females. So if, when they're mating up on those walls, the, um, this um, track that you can see, these tracks up here, that's all of the uh, other animals that are living in that case system or up in that ceiling, walking around during the night. So Murray had cameras set up in the caves and he, he uh, watched a huge amount of video and he came up with that. So if you have those long legs out there, the female can sit in underneath there. She's protected from being disturbed by any of the other uh, animals in there, the other weather, beetles, spiders, centipedes, cockroaches, you know, anything that's walking around on the ceiling or the walls of those caves. So, less disturbance means uh, much um, better uh, mating success. So that's a sort of superpower of uh, male cave weathers. In this instance, the uh, uh, you know, research was done in white tomo caves, and so that's why that species is there. But it'll be similar with those species and uh, so forth as well. Right, moving on. So that's one of the superpowers of cave weirs. 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, tree weather because that's the sort of weather that we encounter the, uh, more often. It's the one that uh, comes into our houses, hangs out with us, looking at it, and uh, generally scaring everybody uh, with its beauty. So Hemadina thoracica is a species. Uh, it's found all over the North Island, so not truly Auckland tree weather, um, except for in the Wellington and Wairarapa areas. It's a different species, and then in the Hawke's Bay, there's a pocket of uh, that species as well. It's got a larger body, as I said, broader and longer, and it's arboreal, coastal to lowland forest, and, uh, less than 900 metres. So that's perfect. The Waitaki Range is a perfect habitat for uh, the Auckland tree weather. And so uh, that's quite a good place for it. Now, uh, it, so there has been some research done that uh, if uh, the temperature warms or the climate is a lot warmer, then uh, these Auckland tree weather will outcompete those uh, weather in that area. So there is a little bit of um, bit being done on that to look at what could happen in global warming. And then also the, it selectively feeds on um, shrubs and trees that have small seeds that it can consume. So Mahoe, Karamu, uh, a couple that are uh, quite readily uh, eaten, and I've, I often see weather on these two uh, species out there in the Waitaki Ranges where I live. Uh, it's feeding leaves, fruit, and of course they're feeding on uh, other invertebrates as well. Now, the superpower for tree weather, if you're wondering, is that if those seeds on those uh, trees and shrubs do pass through the gut, then they're more likely to, uh, to seed and germinate. So it increases uh, the fitness of those seeds uh, quite substantially. So it's good to have your uh, tree workers out there in the garden uh, looking out uh, for those uh, plants that have a nice small seed to consume. Okay, Ooh, we'll move on. Right. Other things that um, you can tell the difference between tree weather uh, male and female. So here is a picture on the right there on, on the tree. At the top you have a female of the ovipositor circled in red. The male is in the middle with that large head and mandibles. And then another female is down the bottom as well. So that there the bark is being removed and instead of being in a hole, uh, the those three have been gathered underneath a that bark, and the males being able to defend uh, his, uh, two mates there easily. Okay, so the eggs, the female uh, uses the ovipositor to lay the eggs into the soil, like most other orthopterans uh, do that as well. As I said, those, uh, there's a male there with its legs up in its defensive uh, position. So instead of uh, leaping away on those legs, uh, they will put them up in the air. And that, those spines are easily uh, used to defend against bird, uh, you know, vulnerable bird eyes and things like that. It might be coming down to feed on it. Also, some of the animals as well, and of course, humans as well, who are reaching down to try and flick it away. Okay, so they uh, also make noises, so sounds, stridulation, which is produced by the middle legs as well, uh, rubbing on the abdomen. So that's uh, the sort of thing. Now, the superpower that uh, tree we have are uh, these unique ears. So you can find them there, they're circled in this picture, they're circled uh, in red. They're on the knees of the protobia, so the front uh, legs there below the knees. Uh, so most other 
um, hearing insects like locusts and cicadas have a taut um, membrane that forms that tympanal organ. It's like a you can uh, it's like a drum, so pull taut, but it picks up the uh, vibration and hears that way. But uh, these three wear have these channels, and you can see the channels there in the legs there in the tympanal organ there, filled with lipid liquids. Liquid lipids, sorry, these fatty compounds. And that gives them uh, a, a, a unique hearing ability. So they can hear sort of near to far field sounds and also pick up vibrations as well. So they're up there being pretty cool in the forest. So the only other animals that use this hearing uh, are toothed whales. So sperm whales. Um, well, we were older than sperm whales, so our sperm whales took this ingenious adaption from our weather. So there has been quite a bit of work done on uh, this by Kate Lowe's in Auckland University as well. Three minutes, David. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So why should we be looking out for tree weather? Because uh, these are the sort of things that uh, we should be thinking about when uh, we look at tree weather out there in the environment. Not that it's a horrible thing. So it enhances plant abundance by increasing seed fitness. You know, so it's increasing plant diversity around the place as well. They improve soil condition with fresh, so the droppings, because uh, they're munching down on leaves and things like that, breaking and it's going through the guts, starting to break down. Then when it comes out the other end, drops to the soil, uh, increases uh, the condition of that. They're a vital part of the food chain. So in native systems, they are eaten uh, as adults, but those nymphs, those 10 instant nymphs are also taken by a wide range of different uh, native invertebrates and animals as well. They're sensitive to climate change. So global warming will probably reduce weather diversity because these guys will take over those pockets in Wellington, possibly the Hawke's Bay, and drive those other uh, species that are in cooler areas out. They're 270 million years old with great ears. Now, how many uh, people can say that once they get to that age that they can still hear? And of course, they're cute. Some people don't think they're cute, but uh, I have the uh, option of calling it cure. What else? Uh, however, there's a lot of threats out there that they're under, and so they're uh, quite uh, vulnerable, vulnerable as well to disappear from the light of ranges. So studies have shown that artificial light uh, stops that aggregation behavior, so no more homes, means lower uh, reproduction rates, and therefore no weather in the future, so the population could crash. There's some real, uh, there's all of course all of the other uh, pests out there that will feed on weather, but also these new invasive species that seem to have the same niche as well. So Australian flying weather, I don't know if you've encountered it, but it's out there and it's quite, um, in my garden in Langhoe, uh, there'd be probably 50-50 uh, of those things, 50% of these things are uh, Australian flying weather and also tree weather out in the garden at the moment. So they are increasing and considerably since they arrived. And also in this summer in Northland, I encountered the olive green coastal katydid. And yeah, it looks really nice, but it is really aggressive. So at night, at, during the day, it was mild mannered and uh, okay to hang out with, but during the night it switched on to being quite aggressive and they would, and they aggregate as well, so in large um, clumps, I suppose, of individuals, and they would follow me around, you know, checking me out, and uh, difficult to catch as well, so that's probably another one to look out for that. Uh, might cause some problems. Now, here's just the slides uh, to show you all of that information. Of course, we've got the uh, human influence on our weather from the fly spray. Most people 
instead of grabbing a camera and taking a photo of this cute guy at the bottom here in the middle, they uh, grabbed a fly spray screen and then pickle it in that, uh, that spray. You've got all of those vertebrates that are in the juice eating and killing these things. You've got that light pollution that's uh, causing them not to reproduce properly. And then there's the new uh, things there. So the Australian flying letter of the left hand bottom, and then the olive green Katie did at the uh, right hand bottom that are all sort of posing a threat to our tree litter in Auckland. And thanks for listening. And here is the references I've used to uh, gather that information. So I'll just finish. And, Thank you, David. Uh, um, Stop sharing. So yes. how I do that. Okay. Right. So just some Stop questions sharing. quickly in in the last two minutes that we have here. Um, I, I, uh, Wayne has asked, do we have remnant populations of giant wetter living in the wild? Uh, not in the Waitakere Ranges, certainly not. They would have been. They probably would have been found by now if they uh, were there. Okay, um, and then Chris is wanting to know, did the Northland Tusk wetter used to occur this far south, but retreated back north due to mammalian pressures, or have they never established this far south, please? Uh, I'm, I'm not actually sure. I, I have encountered the Northland Tusk wetter, but it's very patchy in its distribution, even in Northland, so I'm not sure if it has ever been in uh, the Waitakere Ranges. And certainly the Waitakere Ranges are a strange um, area because there's other th things that, are, that, shouldn't, that should be there and they're not there, other insects as well. So yeah, it's a bit of a, I'm not, yeah, I'm not quite sure would be my uh, answer to that. Okay. More research would be nice. Yeah, Danilo has um, just confirmed ground wetter have no ears. Um, and yeah, uh, ground wetter have no ears. They have no ears? Yes. Oh. <laughs> my, son. Uh, my son has no ears either. Yes. And um, Wayne is also wanting to know whether we should encourage the killing of the Australian flying wetter. Um. Hmm. Yes, well, yeah, that's a that's another thing, isn't it? Really, uh, we don't know what the impact will be, but it certainly is uh, posing a threat to uh, that. Um, you know, it's it's inhabiting the same niche, so it's going to have some sort of impact. But we don't know what the impact will be at the moment. That would be my thing. It's the same with the that olive. Uh, green Katie did. It was quite, yeah, I couldn't believe how aggressive they were at night. There's a bunch following you around. 